So what are proteins? Does anybody know what proteins are? Proteins are huge. They're again molecules. All right. So they're basically we make we, we have atoms that we link together to make molecules. But proteins are very, very large molecules. They're very important in the functioning of the human body, and your brain is no exception. They're so-called macromolecules. They may contain thousands of atoms linked together. All right. And the way you, you know, the thing about proteins actually is that you've got smaller molecules, which are the so-called amino acids, right, which you link together to make larger molecules, which are the proteins. Okay. Now the amino acids, there's 20 of them. Well, they, they could be in principle, you know, um, infinitely many of different amino acids, but nature uses 20 amino acids to make all the proteins in your body. Um, I'm just going to read them out to you. you. I'm not expecting you to le learn them. I just want you to once have heard, ah, you know, this is something that's an amino acid. All right. Glycine, alanine, valine, leucine, isoleucine, methionine, phenylalanine, tryptophan, and proline. Do any of those names sound vaguely familiar? If you ever read any food labels, or if you, <laughs> yeah, tryptophan, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, sort of tryptophan is an interesting one because it's actually also a, you know, you use it to make a neurotransmitter called serotonin, which is very important for mood disorders. All right. So um, if you have somebody who says, you know, people who are uh, depressed. Often doctors say, oh, you know, maybe something wrong with the serotonin levels. Tryptophan is what you make serotonin out of, all right? So you got to, you know, you want to have, make sure you get enough tryptophan in your diet, all right? Uh, broccoli is also to be good source of tryptophan, all right? Ser you know, these all, by the way, are hydrophobic amino acids. They like to mix with fat. They don't like to mix with water. Hydrophilic amino acids, serine, threonine, cysteine, tyrosine, asparagine and glutamine, all right, and then charged ones, charged meaning that they themselves form ions, they will give off electrons or attract electrons, extra ones, all right, aspartate, glutamate, lysine, arginine and histidine. Anybody ever heard of monosodium glutamate? All right, it's a much maligned substance. Um, it's a substance where everybody says, oh, it's so bad for you, it's so bad for you. Well, actually, it is the most important chemical neurotransmitter in your brain. All right? uh, your body needs it, and your body needs it in copious quantities. Um, so, um, but it needs it in the right place at the right time. <laughs> your brain has actually got a very sort of... Um, what you don't want is if you go to a you know, slap-up Chinese meal and you get a lot of glutamate and it all goes straight into your brain because you, it, that would be a surefire recipe for an epileptic fit. But um, because that would be such a bad idea to flood your brain with glutamate, your brain actually has a very effective barrier to keep glutamate out of your you know, the courses around in your bloodstream out of your, away from your nerve cells, the so-called blood-brain barrier. Okay, so glutamate is not nearly as bad as people think it is. And also, you know, all the, you know, anchovies and uh, many lovely tasty cheeses and so on, they're actually tasty because they got glutamate in them. So you've got these amino acids, which are themselves relatively small molecules, and you string them together like pearls on a string to make proteins. And the order, okay, so it's imagine you've got 20 different types of beads and you've got to make long, you know, chains out of these beads, all right? And you can basically pick them in any order you like. Well, only that you can't. The order in which you have to put them together is written down in your genes, all right? Your genome, the DNA in your cells, basically tells your body which order it has to stick these amino acids together in order to make the proteins on your body. And that is the only thing that your genes tell your body. Okay? It's just a recipe for making the different proteins in your body. All right? Because once you've stuck these things together in the right way, they'll do all the rest. Pretty much everything. 
So how do they do this? Well, okay, so how do they stick together in the first place? The thing is, if it, amino acids are called amino acids because they've got an amino group and a so-called carboxy group, which makes it slightly acidic. And the thing is that if you, you can basically link these together through a so-called peptide bond to end up with you know, two chains where you can still have uh, an amino group at one end and the carboxy group at the other. And then you can stick another one on and another one on and another one on. And you can make very long chains and a typical protein will have, you know, many hundreds to many thousands of these things stuck together. And because, of course, some of these will then be uh, hydrophobic, water repellent, others will be hydrophilic and, you know, like to mix with water, others will be positively charged, others will be negatively charged, this long chain will then fold spontaneously into sorts of different sorts of shapes. They can form into so-called alpha helices, which themselves can form together into so-called beta-pleated sheets, and you'll get a very complicated shape. All right. And this shape will have uh, will be uh, attracting ions because of its electric properties at one end and will repel them at the another end and so on. And because of that, it can do a variety of things. It can, um, uh, for example, form a little pore that will sit quite happily in our phospholipid bilayer. All right? Because it's it likes to mix with water here and here. It doesn't want to mix with water there. And it just sits there and it has the shape of a pore so stuff can go through here. All right? So, so it's shape of a what? Say again? Shape of a what? A shape of a pore, like a, like a little channel, like a hollow, you know, um, how do I explain it? Like a little tube. All right? It's like a tiny little tube. All right? Uh, so we've got a tiny little tube that we can embed into our membrane and that now means that we've got a place where for example uh, you know the water can't go through here and ions can't go through here uh, but they can go through this little tube to the little pore the little channel all right but only if the channel lets it all right and this channel may sort of change its mind about whether it lets a particular ion through or not all right and of course, if this now lets ions through only in certain times and not in others, then it will allow electrical currents, which are carried by the charges in these ions, to flow only under certain conditions. So we basically made ourselves a little switch, all right, a little electrical switch that's made out of protein that sits in that little uh, sits in that membrane. So proteins really do a number of different things. We've got these transmembrane channels I've just mentioned. Okay, they're basically these little pores that sit in the in the fatty membrane. Other important things are so-called enzymes. Okay, you can get proteins. All enzymes are proteins. They're proteins that are wrapped up in a particular way that encourages other molecules to come together so that they can react together and form different bonds or break up different bonds or so on. Okay. Um, then you get. Um, then we get the channels that we just talked about. You can get so-called structural proteins, which just form long chains that are like scaffolding. All right. Um, Sorry. I'm no, no, do come in. Um, and then you get so-called um, receptors, which um, are, um, you know, which can sense that the presence or the absence of other substances. So if you, you can imagine that if you've got a protein, okay, that's folded into a particular shape because it's got you know, positive and negative charges sitting on it. If there's another molecule that has particular charge configuration that slots into it, you know, it's shaped a bit like a lock, okay, and you've got another molecule that fits into it like a key, it might change the shape of a protein and thereby make it do something else, all right? And this would then be a receptor. And you can have receptors like this that are sitting on top of nerve cells and find other things. And we'll talk more about that in just a, you know, later. All right. Now, I'm wondering, actually whether this would be a good point to have a little break. Would that be a good point to have a little break? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. You've come, at the, you've come at the perfect time. They can... I've hit half time and I missed that. Uh, no, excellent. You've done, you've done very well. So, I mean, I think, of course, you know, this, uh, because now there is a common room, apparently, if you want to, you know, it's even got a coffee dispenser. Whether it's any good, I've got no idea. Okay. But, you know, just tell our newcomer over coffee what he's missed. <laughs> <laughs>